If you're just joining us uh, as I transition uh, between singing and and preaching, which is a a great thing. I I love actually doing that. I get to to just praise God and then then just spew out his word. And that's just wonderful because God's word um, now just uh, affects us and moves us. And and if you've been joining us, uh, if you're just joining us this summer, we're, we're looking at God's word to discover what God wants us to hear about prayer. Um, one of the reasons why I love, love praise and worship music so much is because uh, modern praise and worship music is, is about the, the cry, the heart. It's looking back to what King David did in the Psalms, and it's speaking to God and, and, and just declaring his worth. If you want a simple definition of prayer, it's simply talking to God. It sounds simple, doesn't it? Prayer is talking to God. But when we think about what that means and what it looks like, there's a lot of different ways we can pray. You, you can write out prayers. You can speak prayer. It, it can be out loud. It can be silent. It can be private. It can be public. It can be formal. It can be informal. It can be sung. You can speak it in a monotone if you really want. Uh, it, it's, but it's so central to what we do and who we are as a church. That, that We as, as Calvary Bible Church are here to change the world. And when we come together collectively uh, to encourage, strengthen, and nourish one another, prayer has a central role in that. Uh, Jesus thought the church was pretty important. Jesus loved the church. He said, uh, he said I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. It's his church. That's so significant. Pastors don't build churches. Elders don't build churches. Deacons don't build churches. Volunteers don't build churches. Jesus builds his church. And and the way in which we see Jesus' church be built is through prayer. Jesus said this too. He he said, my house should be called a house of prayer for all the nations in Mark 16. So if Jesus wants to build his house and he wants to do so through prayer, we need to pay careful attention to what Jesus said about prayer. We need to pay attention to prayer in general. That's a problem for us, if we're honest with ourselves. Uh, if, um, don't raise your hands, but what did prayer look like in your life this week? How many of us can, can honestly say that, that when it comes to prayer, we've got it down? We, we, we can't improve anymore. We're, we're fully meeting God's expectations for us regarding prayer. How many of us can say that? Don't, don't raise your hands. Because the answer is none of us. None of us can. We, we know that we're not praying as frequently, as fervently as we should. And Jesus knew that as well. That's why he perfectly modeled prayer for us. His disciples saw him praying. Uh, I think that's so important. Uh, by the way, if you think you're too spiritual to need prayer, think again, because if there's one person that was so spiritual that he didn't need to pray, it would be Jesus. And yet, we find Jesus consistently, regularly taking time to pray. We we can look to Jesus for all sorts of uh, ways in which the spiritual disciplines are modeled. Some people say, I don't need church. I can go to a coffee shop, the Bible, I can sit down with a few friends. If there's anyone that didn't need to go to church, it would be Jesus, right? Right? I mean, who's going to teach him anything? All right. If there's anyone that didn't need to go to church, it would be Jesus. But every Sabbath, where was Jesus? He was in the synagogue, worshiping with God's people. Uh, we need prayer. We, we need to read God's word. We, we need to go to church. We need to fast. We need to share the gospel. Jesus modeled all these things for us. The eternal Son of God perfect limb of God perfectly modeled the spiritual disciplines for us. And he is holy to begin with. He didn't need to be perfected in any way. But he still practiced those disciplines of prayer, Bible study, church. To him, there's natural breathing. It's so essential. And, and, And prayer, his disciples saw it. They saw his prayer life and they asked him, teach us to pray. There's something so significant about what you do, Jesus. We want that for ourselves. And so that needs to be our heart as we, as we look to prayer. Jesus, teach us to pray. And so what we're going to focus on this week in, in Matthew chapter 6, uh, you might know is the Lord's Prayer. Um, actual, actually, it's the disciples' prayer. It's what Jesus teaches his disciples to pray. 
And so Matthew chapter 6, um, actually next week we're going to take a look at the actual Lord's Prayer. We're going to look at John 17 and, and look at what Jesus prayed for you and for me. That's the Lord's Prayer. This week, however, we're focusing on the disciples' prayer. And, and my goal is not just to impart knowledge to you. Uh, my, my goal this morning is, is that as a result of a God working through his word, that your prayer life would be different this week than it was last week. Sound good? All right, that's our goal. So if you're not there already, Matthew chapter 6, I want to invite you to stand with me. I know we've, we just sat down, we just got comfortable, uh, but I'd like us to stand and honor God's word as we look at Matthew chapter 6. And I'm just going to go ahead and, and start uh, there in chapter, or in chapter 6, verse 1. So again, this is in the, uh, Jesus is in the middle of his Sermon on the Mount. And he says in chapter 6, verse 1, he says, Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room, shut the door, and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Pray then like this, our Father in heaven, Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, Neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Father, thank you for your word. You alone are, are holy and worthy of, of all our honor and glory. Help us to honor your name as we participate in your kingdom-building work. I thank you for meeting our needs. Thank you that you're the great provider. Thank you for the forgiveness of sin that we enjoy offered to us by the shed blood of Jesus Christ. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. You may be seated. And the kids, if you're joining us this morning, I want to encourage you to, uh, to take out the, the half sheet of paper. We've gotten some real doozies in the last couple of weeks. Uh, I've really enjoyed looking at your art. It's, it's, it's like the highlight of my week when I come together and see what you guys uh, glean from the sermon. And so there's a spot here where you can take notes, and there's also a spot where you can, uh, you can draw and try to illustrate uh, what the sermon's about. Uh, and again, I just love seeing what you're drawing, and at the end, you can turn them into myself or Pastor Dave uh, or, or Mr. Jacob. Uh, so I encourage you to take them off. Adults, if that helps you learn, you can draw too, okay? I'm not saying it just for the kids. Some of you are, are tactile learners, and you need to draw and doodle as you're, as you're listening. Whatever keeps you awake. If you need coffee, coffee, all right? Whatever, all right? Just want you to learn. So, so amen, right? So, so as we look at this prayer, it's so rich. And, and even as I was reading it from the Bible, we, we tend to fall into this routine. Oh, I've heard that so many times. Every time at a funeral, every time, uh, if some of you might have grown up in a Catholic church, and this was just part of the regular liturgy that, that, that you heard week in and week out. And so you hear them, and, and your eyes start to glaze over, and your ears start to close because it's so familiar. And we, we never really stop to look at, at, at this prayer communicating the very heart of God and who he wants us to be. Uh, this morning, we're going to see three components of prayer. And Jesus is going to give us the, the motivation for prayer, the model of prayer, and the means of prayer. So, 
So you can draw three circles here. If you're an engineer, this is a Venn diagram. All right, so we have the motivation. We have, uh, what do I say, the means and the model. Okay, so those three areas of prayer we're gonna see in, in Jesus' teaching, and as they converge, that's our goal. That if we just have the mod motivation for prayer, but we don't have the model, we're missing something. If we just have the model, but our motivation is not correct, we've missed something. If we just have the, this surrounding means, but we're not praying, we're not meeting God's expectations of what prayer should be. The reason why I start at the beginning of, of, of the chapter is because I think it's important that we understand the motivation that, that Jesus wants us to have as we look at prayer. Again, Jesus is giving this prayer as a Sermon on the Mount. He's contrasting man's religion with God's worship, with the worship of God. Man's religion, human's religion, everything that we make it to be, everything that we assume it should be, and true religion. And, and he's showing and displaying the heart of what we do is what matters in our, in our worship. And so we have this contrast, and, and here in chapter 6, we have the same contrast. In the first four verses, Jesus is talking about giving. He's saying that some people give so that they'll be noticed. That they like that plaque. They like, uh, they like the recognition that they get from making that big gift. And, and Jesus says that is no value to God. That we don't give so that people notice us. That true religion gives without any desire to be recognized by people. That I know that God knows what I give and that's enough for me. Uh, and this is hard. A lot of what we do as Christians, it's very visible. People can see if you come to church. People can see you give. People you use religious activities so that, that, that they can control others or have their status be looked at differently. Uh, Nietzsche talked a lot about that, looking at religion very negatively and saying that, 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 that people use religion to get power so that they can exercise power and control over others. And, and that's politics. That's not religion. When you start comparing your worth against others, you want others to see how religious, how moral you are. Your motivations are not correct. You're, you might be religious, but you're religious for the wrong reasons. You're selfish. You're political. Politics is, is basically defined as, as any activity that's aimed as, at improving your status or position. And so if we worship, we can't, you can't worship and, and try to improve your status or, or position, but if you do worshipful activity, it ceases to be worship. And now it's just entertainment, it's, it's just politics, whatever you want it to be. Jesus calls you a hypocrite. And so how do we know if our motivations are correct? How do we know if we're just a hypocritical politician? Well, Jesus gives us a, a litmus test when it comes to prayer. He says, basically, spend time praying in private. Pray in secret. Pray so that nobody knows that you're praying except you and God. No other motivation. There, there's no possible way for you to improve your position or status because nobody knows you're praying. That's what he says uh, there in verse 5. He says, don't be like the hypocrites. They love standing in the synagogue street corners. They love being seen. We have an example of this in the Gospels where, where, where the Pharisee was, was just standing and praying out loud. But Jesus says, when you pray, go to your room. Shut the door. Pray to your fathers in secret, and your father who sees in secret will reward you. So if you feel the need to, to, I can't pray unless other people know that I'm praying, right? Uh, that that I, I, if I'm going to be real spiritual, I've got to take that, that shot of, of me praying over a Bible with a cup of coffee on Facebook, and then people know I'm really spiritual. Um, no. It's, it's hypocritical. So is it political? Secondly, is it a performance? Is it just a way to... to entertain uh, or to get something from God? Do I see God as a cosmic vending machine? If I push all the right buttons, if I say just the right words, God is going to give me such and such. When you look at the history of religion throughout the ages, most people, when they, when they pray, when they do any sort of religious activity, it's to get something. If I, if I do this dance, then it'll rain, all right? If you're a farmer, right, and, and you want it to rain, you do the rain dance, 
It's the prayer that sees God as the cosmic vending machine. And Jesus warns against this, heaping up empty phrases like the Gentiles, for they think they'll be heard with many words. Literally, it's babbling. It's an intense babbling. Uh, like prayer is some magical incantation. And if I say it just right, I can control God. And if I do it frequently enough, it's even better. Um, I taught world religions at, uh, at the State College of Florida for a while. And, and so I was exposed to all these different religions as I was teaching them. And uh, uh, I learned that Tibetan Buddhists, they have something called a prayer wheel. And so they, they write this, this mantra or this prayer on this wheel, and then they spin it around and around and around. And, and every time the wheel is around, it's like they're saying this prayer to in, improve their karma. And so the more they spin it, the better you spin it, the better your karma. And we look at it like, well, that's silly. But do we do the same thing? The, 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 the better I pray, the better words I can use, the, the greater response that I'll get from God. And we forget that that's not the kind of communication that should exist between a father and a child. That's communicating in heaven as it is on earth, instead of on earth as it is in heaven. Um, for example, some of you might have a really good relationship with your boss. Okay? Some of you are laughing and don't, uh, but, but I'm assuming some of you do. Maybe your boss is your friend, but at the end of the day, even if you have the best relationship with your boss, uh, your boss has an expectation or conditions that he expects to be met based on your performance. And if your performance doesn't live up to the expectations or conditions, you're going to get fired eventually. And, and some of us, we, we have that same idea. Uh, we, we, we grew up maybe seeing our own dad or our own father in terms of performance. Maybe you grew up trying to impress your dad. And, and, and a father naturally has expectations for kids and, and wants their children to, to perform well. I know I do for my children. But, but a father should be unconditionally committed to their children, e even when a child fails. And so the father-child relationship, it's based on grace. It's not conditioned. Love is not conditioned. And, and, and it's very intentional that Jesus says, you pray to God as father. He, he's heavenly. He's, he's hallowed, or, or, which means holy. He's king, he's provider, he's deliverer. All that's in there, but all that is, is under the umbrella of God being a good father. And some of you are saying, well, you know, I had a lousy father, and so it jades my idea of I can't relate to God because I had such a terrible father, and, and I'm mad. Well, you do have an idea of what a good father is. Otherwise, you wouldn't be mad. All right? You, you have a standard by which you're judging your own father. And so you know what a good father is, and that's why you're mad because your earthly father didn't live up to your expectation of what a father should be. We know what a, a father should be. It's, and prayer is communication based on a perfect family relationship. God is the perfect father that we all long for. Whether we had a good father on earth or a bad father on earth, our father in heaven is perfect. And our motivation isn't to perform well for our dad in heaven. Our, our motivation is not to be political for other people. The horizontal and the vertical uh, motivation needs to be correct. Uh, our, our motivation is to communicate with the, the, the dad, the father in heaven that loves us so desperately. It, it's the opposite of power. It's giving up power. It, it's, it's surrendering. It's relaxing. It's putting yourself in the arms of your dad. That's not the religion of the world. It's true religion. That's the motivation. So what's the model? What's the model? How do we pray? Jesus says, verse 9, look at it. He says, pray then like this. And by the way, when Jesus says pray like this, he didn't mean that you can only pray these words. Okay? They're great words to pray. You, you should pray them. But it's a model for all prayer. It's a flow. It's a pattern. And so our prayer needs to follow this model or this pattern, not, not, not just to mimic those words and, and just have them be wrote so that, that they carry no more meaning anymore. It's what they mean. It's what the model. That's what the heart is that Jesus is communicating. So what is it? Uh, I'm going to give you a little acronym. Uh, Pastor Dave gave you one with uh, ACTS last week. Remember, A was adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and 
supplication. It's kind of hard to hold up four fingers. Okay, so I'm going to give you a new acronym today. Okay, the first one is praise. Okay, the first one is praise. Uh, Jesus starts off saying that you start by saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. He's basically saying that we praise God for who he is, who we are talking to. And, and when we do that through God's word, um, how many of you are familiar with George Mueller? I mean, you wouldn't know him. He lived a long time ago, but you know of him. George Mueller uh, was a, a, a man of God known for his prayer life, and God used him to build orphanages. And, and he, or in his lifetime, he cared for over 10,000 orphans. Uh, he founded over 17 schools, and, and which educated over 120,000 children. And so he was known for his prayer life. And, and he said, he said, when I used to rise from bed, I would begin to pray as soon as possible, but I often spent a quarter of an hour to an hour on my knees struggling to pray while my mind wandered. Isn't that honest? Okay, ha that ever happened to you? All right, your, your mind just starts wandering. You're like, I'm going to pray. And you, you start praying, and then your mind just starts wandering. So listen to what Mueller said. He said, I rarely have this problem now, and here's why not. As my heart is nourished by the truth of the word, I'm brought into true fellowship with God. I speak to my father and to my friend, although I'm unworthy about the things that he has brought before me in his precious word. What Mueller is saying, and, and, and I would suggest you try this too, is that you start your prayer time with an open Bible. Um, and, and just start reading. And it won't be long until, until you're just overcome with God's greatness and who he is and you begin to praise. Uh, I've been reading for Philippians over and over again in preparation for our next series. And, and, and just this morning, I was reading it again. And, um, and I came across the phrase, let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. And, and that phrase just walloped me this morning. And, and I'm just struck by praise that what God did for me and, and what my life should be as a result of what he did for me. I mean, I was a, I was a cute five-year-old kid. I know it's hard to believe, but I was a cute five-year-old kid at one time, but I was a cute five-year-old kid headed for hell. And, and there was nothing I could do to earn salvation, and God reached down and he plucked me from the grasp of sin and death. And, and he set me apart for his glory and, and in his I don't know why he chose me to preach. <laughs> I, I, I had a stutter as a young kid. I wasn't good at talking. I don't talk so good. And uh, I, I never would have thought that I would have been a preacher growing up. But God chose me for some reason. But yet, when I look at my life and, and look at what he did as the only one capable to save, he, he's the only one worthy of praise and does my life I, I'm so unworthy to be a recipient of the gospel my life belongs to him he purchased me does my life belong to him and it just takes my breath away the word of God reminds you of, of, of the truth of what God has done for us and who he is when, when you look at this prayer here in Matthew 6 all over half of it's about God it has nothing to do with our needs or difficulties. The first goal of prayer is to plunge our hearts and our minds into the greatness of God and praise Him until we're dazzled with His greatness. Um, I, I love studying theology because it helps me better appreciate God. And there's so much theology in this prayer. I look at it, and I know this is very abstract, but, but, but it tells us so much about God. It says he, he's heavenly. He's, he's infinite. He's transcendent. He, he's hollowed. That means he's holy. He, he's sovereign and kingly. Thy kingdom come. He's personal. He has a name. He's father. He is not just father. He's our father. It's language of intimacy. So much information and just condensed about God in this prayer, how great he is, how accessible he is, how, how sweet and loving and holy he is. It's there. Am I dazzled with who God is? We start with praise. Second, we remember. We remember. We remember 
that we are children of the king. He says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's the heart of worship right there. That the praise leads us to submit to a holy and good father and, and, and to submit to God is to worship him. When, when we say, your will be done, what, what you're saying is that, that I'm renouncing my plans and I accept yours. I'm remembering who's in control. And I say remember too because God is never out of control. He's always in control. We need to remember that he is in control. And we remember that he's good in order to trust him even when our situation doesn't seem good. We have to remember in our hearts that, that God loves us, that, that all things work together for the good of those who are called according to purpose, his purpose. The, the, Joseph had to remember this. Uh, if you remember the story of Joseph, it, it, he, he went through a rough time, slavery, prison, separated from his family, and then he looks at his brothers in Genesis chapter 50, and he says, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for what? Good. And so we remember to appreciate who, who God is and we understand who we're not and we submit ourselves to him. And this is hard to do because we think we know better than God, if we're honest. Um, uh, imagine um, a little boy, okay, uh, sitting by his father in a car, maybe seven years old, okay? And he's sitting by his dad in a car and they're driving along and, and you pull up to the parking place and, 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 and the little boy looks up at his daddy and says, Daddy, let me drive. And, and so the father would turn to him and say, well, son, you have to understand, you have to remember, you can't drive because, well, first of all, your feet can't reach the pedals. Besides that, you can't see out, and you don't have the reflexes. And, and in our state, you're not allowed to drive until a certain age. So it would be very bad if I let you drive. You just can't do it. And so the little boy cries. He says, I don't understand. And you say, well, you're seven. You're not going to understand. You have to trust me that, that I know best. Adults understand these things. And so even though he doesn't understand, he gets upset. But if he's a good child, he accepts this child-adult distinction and goes along and obeys what the parent says. Now, <laughs> there's some kids, maybe you are one or maybe you know one, um, who are not in touch re with reality. They, they don't accept the idea that I'm a child, you're an adult, and that I can't do what you can do. And there are children that as soon as the daddy's back is turned, they grab the keys in spite of what daddy said and run over to the car, put themselves in the car, turn the ignition, take off and die. There's kids like that we know. And, and, and spiritually, we're a lot more like that second kid than the first, if we're honest with ourselves. We, we don't accept this creator-creature distinction we, we don't remember the, the reality of, of, of who we are and who God is. And so we get angry, we get mad because God doesn't meet our expectations of how reality should be. We forget that God knows best. And Jesus says, you need to remember who's in control. Your kid gets sick, remember. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Your boss yells at you, remember. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. You lose a job, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. You get rejected, your boyfriend or girlfriend breaks up with you. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Remembering that God knows best means that we live with this kingdom mindset. It means that, that we obey him, that we get busy making disciples even when we don't feel like it. I don't want to talk to this person. I don't want to be rejected again. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. God, why did you put this person into my life to love? They're kind of messy. They're kind of stinky. It's, it's uncomfortable to be by them. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. You know, we get bitter when we think that we know better than God. We need to remember the reality that, that God knows best. And you begin to see what happens when we pray with this mindset. When, when, we, when we begin with praise, when we remember who God is, it starts to change who? Does it change God? No, it changes us. We, we're changed. We don't get power, we give it up. Right? But in doing so, we're, we're happier, we're, we're less anxious, we won't be fearful, we have joy, we won't have anger or bitterness, prayer changes us. It's been so true in my life. I remember, man, it seems like God puts some people in your life just to irritate you. Um, 
<laughs> like, I thought you were a pastor. You're supposed to just love everybody. Well, man, I remember this one gal that I had to work alongside, and we must have had, like, the, the I, I don't know, all the personality, behavioral things, uh, Pastor Tame and Dawn, but, like, she was probably exact opposite of me, and we just clashed. Or maybe she was more like me, and, and that caused the clash. I don't know. But we just did not get along, and, and there was just anger and animosity. And I got really convicted over that. And so I, I went and I complained about her to somebody, and that person said, well, have you prayed for her? Oh. <laughs> and so I started praying that God would change this gal. <laughs> All right? It, it's, it's not Christy, by the way. <laughs> it's not like, oh, this lead is somewhere. No, I, I, I met Christy. I was just head over heels in love, right? No, but, uh, um, and so I started praying that God would change this gal. And, uh, and, and sure enough, God, in a sense of humor, didn't change her. He changed me. And, and, and I started developing compassion for her, and, and, uh, um, and, and, and by the end of the time that we working together, we were pretty good friends. Was back when I was a single guy, okay? I was allowed to have uh, single girl friends at that point. But um, uh, God changed me through prayer. And God, God can do that when we come to him with the right expectations, remembering that he's in control. A third, after the praise, after remembering... Starting to see the pattern here? Then we ask. When we're praising God, when we're remembering who he is, we're going to be praying according to his will. We're going to be praying those kingdom-focused prayers. Uh, the, the kingdom, when we talk about the kingdom, that, that's the world healed, physically, spiritually healed. And so we're going to be praying prayers against violence, against domination, against injustice, against hunger, against disease. It also means that we depend on God. And so we can ask, give us this day our daily bread, verse 11. I love that picture. It looks back to the exodus as, as the Israelites are wandering through the desert, and God provided this daily manna for them. And you remember what happened? So, so the Israelites are wandering the desert. They have no food. And, and, and God sends this manna. And what they do? Remember what they did? They, they, did they collect enough just for that day? No. No. They, they said, oh, good. God gives that. And they started to hoard. And like, well, if he gave me this much here, I, I'm just going to collect it and save it for a week. Then I won't have to collect tomorrow. And so they start hoarding because they didn't want to depend on God. They wanted to depend on their resources, their ingenuity to be able to, to, to save and to gather. But God wanted them, them to trust him. He said, I, I want you to gather enough just for that day, trusting that there will be more tomorrow so that you learn to rely on me. And, and Jesus talks about asking. He's going to go on in chapter 11, and we, we looked at that a few weeks ago. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you'll find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. Just keep asking, keep asking. And you might say, well, I, I asked God, and he, and he didn't give it. I asked God for, for that Corvette, and, he, and he, he hasn't given me one yet. <laughs> and we have to remember, you know, go back, you know, remember. That is a good thing. God is wiser than you. He's wiser than me. And so we have this good father that's perfect and gives good gifts. And, and so even our asking, we can, we can trust him that even if we're not asking for the best, we have a father that is not going to give us what we're asking for if it's not the best thing for us. He's going to give us what we need the most. That's our God. And lastly, we yield. The last part of the, of the model is not give me, give me, give me. It's make me, make me, make me. When, when, when you plant something in the ground, God causes the growth and it yields fruit. So this is who God is making me, who I become, what my yield is in us. And so two things that Jesus focuses on us, that, that, that God make me a forgiven person, God make me a person that can handle trials and difficulties. So Jesus says in verse 12, he says, forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Do we walk around knowing that we're forgiven? I mean, that should humble us on the one hand. On the other hand, it should give us an immense joy. Remember Jesus' parable of, of, the, of, of the servant that, that owed this great debt and, 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 and he was forgiven this great debt and he, and he walked away with joy? 
But then what did he do? He went around and he was unforgiven to someone else. And, 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 and so he, he demanded his debt. And so that joy was incomplete because he was not a forgiving person, even though he was forgiven. And so this joy, this humbleness, it's a changed person that understands because I am forgiven, I forgive. And we remind ourselves of that, and that's what God yields in us. Secondly, lead us not into temptation, deliver us from evil. That we need strength, we, we need mercy to face the challenges. That, that our relationship with God needs to yield the strength to be obedient. So we, we, we praise God for who he is. We remember that he knows best. We, we ask for his continued provision, and we yield the result of prayer, the forgiveness, the strength to obey. That's the motivation of prayer. It's the model for prayer. And lastly, the means of prayer is this whole idea of forgiveness. And, and, and Matthew goes into it, verse 14. He says, for if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. And so, in other words, what Jesus is saying is that, that if, you, if you pray to a heavenly father, it doesn't mean anything unless you're coming to him as his forgiven child. Otherwise, it's just words. There's no relationship if you've not been forgiven, if you're not forgiving others. If you don't know that you're a sinner saved by grace, that you've been forgiven, how can you have any sort of family relationship with God? The only reason you have any relationship with God is because you've been forgiven. And so if we really know that I'm a sinner saved by grace and I have this family relationship with God, that when I pray, it's not just easier to forgive other people who've wronged me, but it puts all relationships in the right context. That's powerful. That when we pray according to God's will, we pray rightly, it, it, it gets us in touch with reality, who we are and who God is, and, and gives us rest that we can trust God, and, and, and we have power knowing that, that God is using us as an agent to change the world. But all this stuff is based on the conviction is that I am an unconditionally loved child. I am loved by my Father in heaven. I had a friend and... Um, he used to say to his kids, and I, I loved it, he, he, they'd be disobeying or something like that, and he'd say, um, act like you're a loved child. Right? And, and it kind of made me think, it's like, act like you're a child who's loved, you know? And it's like, oh, yeah. That, that, that if I acted according to the love that God has, has bestowed upon me, how would that change how I act? How would that change my outlook? How would that change the way I interact with others? We can't pray thy will be done unless we realize that, that Jesus also prayed that for us. Remember, that, remember when Jesus prayed that for us? Where was he? When he said, thy will be done? The garden. That Jesus started this, this prayer in Gethsemane. And he said, not my will, but thine be done. And he finished it on the cross. When he said, Father, forgive them. All the punishment that, that you and I deserve, Jesus took on himself. Because of, of his unconditional love, we can be forgiven. And this is a transforming love. We're a child of the king. By this prayer, not my will but thy be done, Father, forgive them, Jesus saved us so that we can live for him. And so we pray that same prayer, understanding who God is, what he's done for me, and letting that light shine. It'll change your life. It'll change your family. It'll change this church. It'll change this world. You ready? Let's stand and close in prayer. Our Father, you, you're holy and righteous and good. Help us to remember that, that because your Son prayed, thy will be done, that we can trust you and also say your will be done. 
Help us to remember that because your son said, Father, forgive them that we are forgiven. And that maybe we need to look at how we see others and offer them the same grace and forgiveness that you've offered us. Thank you for the privilege that we have to, to be here today as your church. And if there's somebody that has come here this morning that has never received you as their Savior, I pray that right now, where they stand, they would admit their sin to you, that they would repent and give control of their life to you. Right now. Father, make us the people that you want us to be. Teach us to pray. In Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. So go be the church. God bless you, and we'll see you next week.